Well, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to church this morning. Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the student pastor. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, isn't Matt just like one, one awesome guy? I mean, can we give it up for Pastor Matt Adrian? He's, he's been giving me a hard time, so I just feel like I need to give him a hard time. Like, it's a tough act to follow when Matt preaches because, like, he has such an extensive vocabulary that, like, as a student pastor, you're like, man, what can I pull out besides selfie and, like, a hashtag? But anyways, I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, and and I, I'm sure that you guys are probably wondering, like, okay, like, we get that Matt said everybody's wearing jerseys this morning. But the question that we're really wanting to know is why on earth would you wear a Detroit Lions jersey, Caleb? I mean, like, it's the Lions, right? And, and here's what I will say is that I am born and raised uh, just outside of Detroit, metro Detroit area, and I love Detroit, okay? My license may say Southern California, but I am Detroit till I die, okay? And, and here's what I'll say. Just hold back all your jokes, Hold back all of your comments, your heckling, like, we're making a comeback, all right? The city will once again rise. Uh, everybody says that. We're, we're still waiting, okay? But I love Detroit, and, and I love Detroit sports. I mean, I'm pretty passionate about all of our teams, even though they're all, unfortunately, really bad. Uh, and, and here's what I know is that living out here in Southern California, there's a lot of, like, transplants, people living from like all over that have moved here. There's a lot of people that I find you, Southern California people can sometimes be like, like bandwagon fans, like you're a Seahawks fan one week and then you're like the 49ers and then it's like the Raiders, okay? Uh, maybe one day you'll jump on board with the Lions bandwagon, there's always room. Uh, but, but here's the thing is I was like, you know what? I need to get myself a jersey because I love the Lions. And so a friend of mine, um, pointed me to a website. Now, this website I won't, I won't name, but needless to say, he's like, dude, you can get good quality jerseys for a great price. And so I go on the website and it's like real authentic jerseys. Like, you know, I'm like, this is a real deal, okay? And the price was, a, it was just too good to beat. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at like paying like $20 for a jersey, you're like, man, that's a great deal. So I'm like, okay, like, so I order this jersey. Meanwhile, I, I tell you, I ordered this jersey before the Lions had an 0-5 start this year. Okay, so it's like, I'm ordering this jersey believing like, this is our year. We're going to the Super Bowl. Okay, again, like I know you're thinking like, there's no way. Uh, but I'm like, this is our year. I'm gonna get a jersey. My dad's like, you're crazy. Sure enough, we start off 0-5 and, and like, because this manufacturer is like, probably somewhere in like China, it took forever for the jersey to get here. I'm like. I don't even want it anymore, okay? They're 0-5, which like, luckily, they won last week, and, and I believe God is blessing them right now, and they're ahead because I'm preaching in a Lions jersey, so I'm just believing. Again, it's crazy faith. It might be stupid faith, but here's the thing, is I get this jersey, and I remember opening it up, and, and Dallas was actually like, he walked in the office right after I'd opened it up, and I remember opening it up and being like, dude, what in the world, like, this is totally the wrong color, okay? Like, the lions are not a powder blue. This is like the wrong color. The lions are what's called a Honolulu blue. It's, it's like a darker blue. And I'm like, this is bad. Like, this is really bad. And then he comes in and he's like, why is the NFL logo on your jersey, like, crooked? And I'm like, hey, man, it's not crooked. And he's like, no, actually the lions thing is crooked. And then we're looking at the tags and it's like, this thing is really bad, okay? Like, this isn't just a knockoff. This is a really bad knockoff. It's 100% not real. And, and I don't know if you've ever been in one of those positions where you thought you were getting something real, but it turned out you got something totally fake. But it's a terrible feeling, okay? And, and this morning, John is talking to us in our Perfect Love series over 1 John, and, and he's got a challenge to us. And he's talking about this very idea of knockoffs. And, and here's the thing I'll tell you is that there's nothing worse than buying a knockoff, but, but you know what gets even more worse? I mean, like, you get that knockoff and you're, you're dreading that moment where people are going to realize what you have is a fake and then you're going to be like, no, 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 like, I promise you it's real and they're going to be like, no, it's not. But, but here's what's worse than being, or buying a knockoff it's, it's being a knockoff. I mean, I would think that for all of us in here, no one would want to say, like, yeah, I, I want to be a knockoff. I want my, my life to be known as a knockoff. We want to be authentic. 
right? But, but here's the thing is John is telling us that, unfortunately, there are knockoff people that are out there. And there are knockoff people that are even in the church. And, and John was writing out of 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, to followers of Jesus. And so I feel like I have to give a little bit of a, of a pre-header this morning, is that John wrote this message to followers of Jesus. So if this morning you're not a follower of Jesus, this may sound a little crazy, it may sound a little wild, but I would just encourage you to keep listening, and it, maybe by the end of this it'll, it'll make sense and you'll understand. But, but John was writing to the church because he believed that there was an urgent message, an urgent warning that he needed to convey to the church. And so we'll pick up in verse 18, and, and John says, Dear children, remember, like the followers of Jesus, he says, The last hour is here. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. And already many such Antichrists have appeared. Okay, this is a tough topic this morning because it's like, just in reading one verse, I mean, it, it's obviously not one of those things. It's like it makes you feel like fluffy and you're like, oh, cool, the Antichrist, right? Like, man, if there's a message I wanted to hear. But, but here's what John was talking to set this up so that we can get into where it applies to us today is that, John made mention of this last hour, and, and keeping reference to football, in football there's what you have known as the two-minute warning, okay? And the two-minute warning means that the game's not over yet, but that it's close to the end, okay? Time is, time is getting there, it, it's about to run out, it's not over yet, but it's coming. And we believe as a church that one day, Jesus is coming back for his children, for his bride, for the followers of him. And, and so we find ourselves in this last, in this last uh, day's phase where, where we're in what John is talking about of the last days. And, and we will be until Jesus comes back for us again. So we've been there from the time he came until the time he comes again. And John makes mention of this word, Antichrist. And, and if you've ever watched the movie The Omen or possibly you listen to bands like Slayer or Marilyn Manson... Uh, none of which that I'm claiming that I listen to and I don't encourage our students to listen to. But, I mean, hey, you never know out there. We know that the Antichrist is definitely made mention in pop culture. Okay, People are talking about the Antichrist, who will be the Antichrist. That it, it's just brought up a lot. And, and what, what this really means is that one day there will be a person that rises up and they will try and to deceive people to, to try and point them away from Jesus. And what Antichrist means at its core is this. It's anyone who tries to oppose Christ. Anyone who opposes Christ and tries to substitute him. And so John isn't talking to us, because this is important for us to understand that John isn't talking to us about like some fulfillment of prophecies or like, you know, like the end times or, or, or this Antichrist, this one Antichrist. Rather, John is talking to us about people who possess this spirit of the Antichrist. And what this spirit ultimately means is people who opposed Jesus. People who opposed Jesus and they try and substitute him. And I mean, you could probably already imagine that, that there are many people in today's world that are trying to do this very thing. And John is saying that there's an urgency in me telling you this because these people are among you. It's not a thing that they're coming, it's a thing that they're already here. He says, you've probably already encountered them. And these are people that are within the very walls of the church. People that we brush shoulders with. I mean, people that could possibly sit in this very room. And I believe this is that the stakes have never been higher for the mission of his church. I mean, the stakes have never been higher. That, that in today's world, leading people to find and follow Jesus here but also as the worldwide church, have never been more important and have never been higher. And we believe that the local church is the hope of the world and that it is his chosen method in which he wanted to build his kingdom and to advance the name of Jesus. But that doesn't come without conflict and opposition. And that's why John's writing, because he knew that Satan would do anything to try and derail the church to try and cause division among believers, to try and stir the pot so that we would, we would, we would become unglued, that we would become unbound, and, and, and that we would, we would turn away from the very things which we once held so dear to. 
And so John's writing, and, and I get that, you know, maybe this morning there's a little bit of a fear in your mind, or maybe you're questioning, and you're like, okay, like, I hear about these knockoff Christians that John's writing about, these people that are trying to, to turn people away. Like, how do I know whether or not, like, that's me? How do I know if I fall into that category? I mean, what if I'm not an authentic follower of Jesus? What if, what if I'm a knockoff? What if somebody in here is a knockoff? What if my friend, what if my spouse, what if they're a knockoff? And I believe that it's, it's, it's our part this morning to look at the scriptures and to look at our lives and to compare the two. And to look at where we find ourselves and the things that John is talking to us about those that are knockoffs and those that are authentic followers of Jesus. But here's why this morning is so important. Okay, and, and don't tune this out. Is it's because authentic Christians care more about living the part than they do looking the part. You see, looking the part is easy. And that's what knockoff Christians do. But authentic Christians care more about living the part. And I believe that it has never been more important for us as a church to lock arms, to stand together, and to rally together around the cause of Jesus Christ so that we can advance the mission. We can advance the name. We can advance the kingdom of Jesus. Because there are people that will try and do anything they can to derail the church. And so John tells us this morning, he, he gives us three things that we can, we can see in, in knockoff Christians, and then he will come back with what authentic Christians display. The first one is this, is that knockoff Christians, they ditch the church. Okay, and in verse 19, John says, these people left our churches. So these people meaning the knockoffs. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. And when they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. So John is saying one thing that you will see in these knockoff Christians is that they will just ditch the church. But I feel like I have to say that this morning, just because you go to church doesn't mean that you've got it all figured out. And it doesn't mean that you've got everything clear, all bases are, are, are covered, and that you're a Christian. You see, going to church doesn't save a person, but rather it indicates that we desire to be in fellowship, in community with other believers because we believe that this is where we learn more about him and that this is where we grow. Now, I need to say this as well. It's because I know it will happen, okay? So don't get in your car after this message or maybe later today and you get on like social media or you get on the phone and you're like, you're thinking of that person who hasn't been at church in a long time or, you know, they like aren't around and you're like, hey, listen, Notice you haven't been at Crosspoint in a while. Uh, I think that you could be an antichrist, okay? Like, I am not suggesting that you do that. Uh, it's, it's just not going to go over well, okay? So, like, don't message anybody like, hey, antichrist, you need to get back here next week. But in all seriousness, it's so sad seeing people leave the church. And, you know, I think about myself in, in college. That I was in a school uh, of people studying to go into ministry, people studying to build his church, and, and people... You know, now I see it on Facebook and on, on Twitter, people that have like dropped out of the church. But what makes matters worse is that they act like they were never even a part of the church. They never even believed in the church. And you might know somebody who's very similar. And here's the reason knockoff people leave the church. It's because it doesn't give them what they want. You see, knockoff Christians, they don't, they don't care about coming into the church to add to it. Rather, they come into the church... And it may not be like in the forefront of their mind, but ultimately they sabotage it. You see, they want to use the church for their purposes and for their plans and for their, their platform. They don't want to use it for the purpose of building the kingdom in which Jesus established a church for. But rather they want to take away from it. And there's a serious issue when we use the church, which is ultimately Christ's bride, for our own selfish purposes. You know, I mean, you see this all the time. People looking for clients or, or they're looking for business, you know. Like they come into church with like their company's name plastered all over them. They got business cards like ready to give out. Like, like there's nothing wrong with having a business and telling people about it. But, but when we use a church for promoting our business or advertising or getting clients or, or we use it as like the church is kind of like this like little social good badge of honor that we wear of like, well, I go to church. I'm a good person, okay? Like, I do this and I do all of these other things and, and this is just kind of like an addition to my life. 
Here's the other thing, okay? And I get that this can get me into trouble. And I'm not saying that, like, this is, like, completely evil in and of itself. But, like, the church is not the eHarmony headquarters, okay? So, like, if you're coming to church and you're like, listen, I just hear there's a bunch of single people, right? You're like, where's the single ministry at? Okay, like, there's nothing wrong with finding a person to date within the church. But when the church is purely the means of finding your date or a mate, like, there's a problem with that. Because the church is his bride meant to advance the name of Jesus to the world. But these knockoffs, they, they don't care about this. And John said that these people never really belonged to us. They never really belonged with us because they didn't stay with us. And you see, what John is telling us is that there's a difference in the knockoff and the authentics. And they may look like the team. They may act like the team. In fact, sometimes they may cheer the team on. But, you know, it would be like me being in Ford Field surrounded by a bunch of Lions fans. And there being all these dark blue jerseys. And then me in my powdered blue, like, whatever color jersey. And then all of these other fans. Like, there would be something wrong because I wouldn't necessarily fit in. And John is saying that knockoff Christians, they'll, they'll try everything they can to look the part. But ultimately... Until they get what they want, which isn't fellowship, it's followship. It's people to follow them, people to just be there for them and do whatever they want for their selfish purposes. He says those are the people that are the knockoffs. And here's what separates the two. At the core, what separates the, the, the two is that authentic followers of Jesus, as he tells us in verse 20, have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit... We know the truth. The truth is that Jesus is the hope of the world. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we desire new things. We have different cravings. We have different desires. We, we want to be involved in the church. We want to engage in fellowship because this is the place that we grow. It's the place that we learn truth. It's a place that we learn about Jesus and that we experience life change. But knockoffs... They don't care about this stuff. You see, they don't care about knowing the truth. They care about just being here for their own purposes, their own agendas. And so the first thing is, is that they, they ditch the church. But the second thing that, that we lead right into is that knockoff Christians, they, they deny Jesus. They deny Jesus. You know, John poses this in, in, in verse 22 where he says, who is a liar? The people that are liars are the people that say that Jesus is not the Son of God, and that God is not the Father. These are the people that are trying to lead you astray. They're trying to feed you a lie. And you see, the thing that we here as a church have in common is the fact that we believe that there is a life beyond the life here on earth. We believe that there is a life filled with hope, a life filled with joy, a life filled with purpose, and that that is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. But the problem is knockoffs, they want to spread these lies in the church, and they want to make Jesus less than who he actually is. In fact, they kind of want to just take Jesus out of the picture completely. And the best way that I can illustrate this is, is there's these things called open-handed and closed-handed issues. And open-handed issues are things that, regardless of our differences, regardless of the fact that we might not agree on the same thing, we can still have unity, we can still get along. At the end of the day, everything is okay. And these are things like, you know, our music preferences, like in, in church, okay? Like some people are like, let's like go old school, let's have the hymns, let's like no instruments. Some people are like, man, let's like rock out, okay? Like at the end of the day, Regardless of those differences, it does not take away from our salvation. It does not take away from our unity and our belief as a church. But there are things like, uh, like our style of dress. They're, they're open-handed issues. And at the end of the day, we're okay. But, but on the other hand is, is the, the close-handed issues. And these are things that we believe are essential. They are vital to our health, our life, and our beliefs as a church, as the body of Christ. And these are things that are non-negotiables, that we don't trade, we don't loosen up our grip. And these are things like, like the Word of God, the Bible. That is, it is the, the authenticity uh, of God's spoken Word to us, that, that we hold true to that. How about God the Father or Jesus the Son? 
the Holy Spirit. These are things that we do not negotiate. They're things that we keep in our fists clenched tight. And I can tell you this, is that as a church, we can never, we can never release our grip on the truth that Jesus is the hope of the world. This can never change. And, and here's what I'll tell you, is that regardless of denominational differences, regardless of these things, the thing that can never change is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, born of a, of a virgin, who has come to save us, who died and then three days later rose again, defeating death, defeating sin, and rose again to heaven to prepare a place for us. This can never change. As a church, we cannot release our grip on this. But what these knockoff Christians were doing is they were coming into the church and they were denying the work of Jesus. They were denying the work of who Jesus was and, and what he came to do. And it goes back to our Jesus period series last fall. And if you weren't here for it, the bottom line was this, is that there will be people that will offer a false religion, a religion that promotes other ways besides Jesus to salvation and to eternal life and to hope and to joy. But but in the end, all of them will fail because it is only through Jesus. It is only through Jesus, period, that we can experience salvation. We can experience life. We can experience hope and freedom. And I'll tell you this, is that it's more than just a confession that Jesus was the, was the son of God. It's more than just a confession that Jesus was a man because even the demons confessed that Jesus was the son of God. But it didn't save them. You see, it's through a personal confession of faith in him, of making him the Lord of our life. And I can tell you this, is that when we settle for a religion without Jesus, we have taken on a fake. It's not about a religion. Because religions will tell you a lot of different things. It's about a relationship. A relationship with Jesus. And anytime you're in a relationship, you desire to grow with that person. I mean, hopefully that would be your aim of being in a relationship with someone. You walk with them, you talk with them, you learn, you experience life together, you grow together. And that's why it's important for us as a church that we immerse ourselves in God's word, that we study God's word, that we live God's word because we believe that this is where we are able to discern the truth and the lies and the people that are trying to, to, to sell us other things besides Jesus, the people that are trying to deny Jesus, this is how we know what is true. Remember, authentic Christians don't just look the part, they live the part. And here's what I can tell you is that when we claim it, when we claim Jesus, when we put on the jersey and we say that we are a part of his team, we have to live like it as well. When we claim it, we have to live it. And in this case, the Holy Spirit fills us. And for those of us who claim Jesus, we begin to, we begin to study his word and to hold fast to that which we believe in the beginning. And that's what separated these knockoffs from the authentics. And, and I'm willing to guess that all of you probably believe whenever I came up here that my jersey was real. I mean, like, why would I just intentionally want to just buy a knockoff, right? You're like, of course you wouldn't do that. Well, I mean, like, fortunately in this case, the price was really low and I didn't know. I should have like known when it said like real in all caps that it wasn't real. But <laughs> here's the thing, is that authentic followers of Jesus, they're able to discern what's real from what's fake. I mean, any Lions fan would be able to look at my jersey and be like, that's not real. Like, that's totally a knockoff. And the same is, is true for us. And so I ask you this. Are you spending enough time in God's word so that you can know the fakes apart from the reals? So that you can know the lies and the truths? Which leads us into the next thing. And this is the last one, is that knockoff Christians deceive believers. And, and I just got to be honest. There's nothing worse than being deceived, okay? Like, nobody likes to be deceived. 
And you thought my jersey was bad, but what makes matters worse is the fact that whenever I ordered this jersey and I opened it and I was like, oh my goodness, this isn't right, I decided like, I'm gonna go a step further. I'm gonna go on that website, to be unnamed, and I'm going to like contact the seller and be like, hey, listen, this is the total wrong color. So like I send this out and some people are like, what did you expect with a jersey that cheap? I'm like, hey, I gotta like at least try. Okay, so I type out like, this is a wrong jersey. And they respond back to me like, mind you, like probably in some other country somewhere. And they're like, this is the color the lion wear. And I was like, hold on here. <laughs> like I'm from Detroit, okay? Like I am a fan. You have not sat through an 0-16 season and still been a fan. You've not sat through an 0-5 start of the season and been a fan. You have not watched them and cried for them more than I have. Okay, and now you're telling me that I'm wrong? They're not the Detroit Lion, they're the Detroit Lions. You can't even get their team name right, okay? And I was like, man, like, there is nothing worse than when you believe something to be true, but yet somebody's like, no, 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 like, you're wrong. Nobody wants to be deceived, but yet these knockoff Christians, they're trying to deceive us. They're trying to lead us astray, and that's what John says in verse 26, is that they don't know the truth. And so they're trying to put up all these empty philosophies or these, these false doctrines, these false theologies, these false teachings. And I'll tell you this, is that there's a difference between deliberate deception and spiritual ignorance. Let me repeat that again. There's a difference between deliberate deception and spiritual ignorance. And while there are people that are out there a lot of times trying to deliberately deceive us, we're not exempt of this as a church, of this spiritual ignorance. You see, a lot of times the Bible gets twisted. I mean, there's a lot of people that are out there and they're preaching a gospel that I, I, like, I have no clue what it is, okay? Like, they have twisted the scriptures. They've twisted things so much. And it's so important that we are in the word and we are growing and we are studying this so that we can know the truth apart from the lies. And sometimes the worst part isn't even others trying to deceive us, it's us deceiving ourselves. You see, we live in a day and an age where, where a lot of people, they want a Christianity that's convenient for them. And so what, what they do is they take the Bible and they're like, okay, listen, how can I apply parts of this that are like comfortable for me so that I don't have to really change too much? And like, I don't really know that I like this part, so like I'll kind of like leave that out and I'll just live by this part. And, and I'll just kind of decide how I want to use this book to speak for my life. Remember, there's a difference between deception and spiritual ignorance. And, and what people ultimately do is rather than allowing God's word to, to speak through them the way it's intended to, in fact, what they do is they just throw it down and they decide, I will let my life speak through the Bible. I will go ahead and I'll decide what works for me. And here's the reality is that we have to believe either all of the scriptures or none of the scriptures. We can't take the Bible and we can't leave parts out and decide what we are going to believe and what we're not going to believe. Authentic followers of Jesus know that this is true. And so they study it and they hide it in their heart. But the knockoffs, they just want to promote this, this false teaching, these empty false beliefs. And John's saying, you don't need any of that. Here's what you need. You as a church, you as an individual, you need Jesus. And when you understand that Jesus is all that you need, you will no longer try to add anything else. You'll no longer try and like find all of this hope in these other places. But you'll find your hope and your trust alone in Jesus. And here's what he tells, here's what he tells us in, in verse 29 or 28. He says, And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ. Remain in fellowship with Christ. He says, remain with me. Remain in me. And John 15, 4 says it like this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. And what he is saying to us, to authentic followers of Jesus, is that if you will remain in me, if you will dwell in me, if you will rest in me, if you will find everything that you need in me, I will give you everything that you need. I will rest in you. I will dwell in you. I will remain in you. But the only way that we can remain in him 
is through walking with him, through relationship with him, through fellowship with him, through learning from his word. So, like I said, we're far too busy in today's world. And we believe, like, you know, we'll just kind of take this on the go, Jesus. And, and we'll apply him when, when we need to. And, and we'll apply parts of the scripture. But that's not what authentic Christians do. We have to spend time with him so that we can know the real apart from the fake. But unfortunately, we're living in a time where, I don't know, I'm an optimistic person, but I don't know that it's necessarily going to be easier for the church. I don't know that the times are ever going to get easier for the church where it's just like we're the, we're the number one leading thing, okay? I mean, we believe that we are the number one leading cause in life change and in hope. But here's the thing, the world doesn't look at it like that. I mean, you know that in every news headline that comes out, in every breaking issue, in all of these issues that happen in society, who is the first to get attacked? It's not the world, it's the church. People are coming at the church and they're throwing darts at the church and they're trying to pin us with our backs against the wall. And I don't believe that it's ever going to get easier for us. And it tells me this, is with all that's happening in the world, as it gets darker, it increases our necessity as a church to live brighter. But in order to live brighter, we have to know his truths. We have to live as authentic followers of Jesus. And he tells us that our command is to remain in him. And he goes on in verse 29. And he says, until the day that he comes back, we're to be full of courage and to not shrink back. You see, we're not supposed to be these people who are like sitting in our closets and we're so scared of the world. We're so scared of those who are coming after the church that we just retreat in fear. But rather, we're supposed to rise, we're supposed to run, and we're supposed to reach people with purpose. The purpose that we believe that this church, the, the, the worldwide church, the local church is the hope of the world, and it is the very method in which he chose to, find, to, to lead people to find and follow Jesus. Remember, authentic Christians don't just look the part, they live the part. And so I want to close with this. Keeping the, the whole sports analogy going is, is uh, you know, there's this whole idea in sports of, like, using a team to, to run up, like, the score in the beginning of the game and then just, like, putting the bad players out there at the end of the game and, and kind of just letting the clock die out. And I can tell you this, is that in a world with broken people, a world that's desolate and it's hurting, people need Jesus. People need Jesus. And there have never been more people alive at one point in the history of mankind on planet Earth as there are now. With around three and a half billion people, there's a big responsibility for the church. There's a lot of people out there. And a pastor that I look up to in Boston, he, he, he gives this illustration and it has always resonated with me. And it goes back to that sports analogy. And he says, here's the two ways that we can look at God and how he chose to use people. Is the first way we can look at it is that God chose to use the most amazing, great, skilled players at the beginning of the game. People like David and Moses and Joshua and Aaron and Paul. And he chose to use the most amazing players at the beginning of the game to run up the score. And now we're just here killing off the clock until Jesus comes back. But I think that's a really sad way to look at things because that gives us no purpose, no responsibility. It gives us nothing to live for. And the second thing, or the second way of living is this, is that God chose to use some amazing players at the beginning of the game to get the score up, but God, but God used some amazing players at the end of the game as well because he knew how high the stakes would be and how much hung in the balance of that game. And so he used us to lead people, to run up the score, to experience hope. And I can tell you this, is that I wanna hang on the second one more than I do the first. And, and, and I believe that each and every life in here today, each and every life in here today has a purpose. You have a story, you have a meaning, you have a reason why you are here. You're a piece of the puzzle and as the church, the big puzzle, we have a purpose of leading people to find and follow Jesus. And, and 
And I don't know how far this morning we are from Jesus coming back. And, and frankly, I mean, this might just be me, but I think we need to like quit the whole talks of like, what day is it exactly? You know, like so many people are so worried about when Jesus is going to come back. And it's like they've shrunken back into their closets and they're just waiting for that day. And they live life scared. And I can tell you this. It's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be a glorious day. But nobody knows when it is. And we need to quit wasting time waiting for that day. And we need to go out. And we need to, we need to take uh, advancements for his kingdom now. We need to go and we need to push the name of Jesus now. There are people. There are three and a half billion people that are on this earth. And they need the message of Jesus. And it's our mission as his church, as his bride, to rally together. And I can tell you this, is that the mission of Jesus can never change. And I don't care what knockoff, I don't care what person that's a fake tries to come into the church, what the media throws at us, what Satan tries to throw at us. We as a church need to stand together. We need to fight together. We need to hold fast together because we believe, we believe in Jesus. We need authentic Christians that are willing to take a stand in a world full of fakes. And here's where we can take hope. Because while Satan may try and throw everything in the world at us, in Matthew 16, 18, it says, Upon this rock, I will build my church. He says, I will build my church, and all the gates of hell will not prevail against it. All the fakes, all the knockoffs, all the stuff out there will not have anything against my church. So in a world that promotes knockoffs and it's, it's easy to be a fake, it's easy to be a knockoff in this cheap replica of promoted society, we need, we need the real authentic Christians to stand up. And I, and I can tell you this, is that as cool as the jersey that I wear is, it doesn't compare to the real thing. I mean, can you see how terrible like, the color difference is now? Like, I'm not just crazy, okay? Here's the thing is when I got this jersey, like my wife had to tell me to like put it away and to just go to sleep because I was just like studying it for like hours. I was like, man, it's so real. Like, look at the tags, look at everything. The NFL logo's straight. <laughs> Here's the thing is nothing will ever compare to the real thing, nothing. And real fans, real followers are willing to pay the price. They're willing to do whatever it takes for the real thing. You know why? Because they believe in it. Because they believe in their team. And so they're willing. While everybody might say that they're crazy, while everyone might say, you guys are 0-5, why would you even cheer for them? They're willing to paint their bodies and to stand in sub-zero temperatures because they believe in their team. And I think how much greater is the responsibility for us as his church to stand and to be real, to pay the price so that we can show people that we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. End of story. <laughs> Authentic Christians are far more concerned with living the part then they are looking the part. And it's our prayers as a church that we, we, we would be filled with authentic followers of Jesus. So I ask you this question this morning. Are you a knockoff? Or are you an, an authentic follower of Jesus? 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this. It says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And so we're going to end this service and in an awesome fashion. What we're gonna do is we're gonna transition now into a time of communion that we believe for us as a church, we get to rally together because we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world and that he came to die for us. And so communion is a time for us to reflect on all that he has done for us. And we take the bread because we believe that it's a symbol of his body broken for us and that the juice is a symbol of his blood poured out for us. And so we take these elements and remember in remembrance of his sacrifice. And not only is this a time to remember what Christ has done for us, but it's a time for us to examine ourselves and to ask ourselves, am I showing the authentic nature of what a follower of Jesus looks like? 
Or am I just living like a knockoff of the real thing? And this is a sacred time for us as followers, as the church. And I get that there may be people in here today that are not followers of Jesus. And, and it's our hope and our prayer that today you make that decision to put your faith and your trust in Him. And after the service, we'll have people down here at the front. We'll have people out in the patio. I'll be down in the patio. We'd love to talk with you and lead you through that. But, but this is a time for us as a church to remember what He has done for us. And so in a minute, when I finish praying, the ushers will come and they'll dismiss you guys. And you'll come down here, you'll grab the elements of communion, and then you'll return back to your seats, and you'll just sit there and quietly, you'll just pray, and you'll take time to reflect and to examine yourself before God. And then when you're done, you can go ahead and take the elements of communion, and we will stand, and as a church, we will sing, because we believe that He is worthy of all of our praise, and because we believe that He is the hope that we are founded on. God, we come before you and we just thank you so much. We thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. And God, I pray that in a world full of replicas and full of fakes and full of knockoffs, that we would be a church that strives to be authentic. That God, we would be far more concerned with living the part than we are looking the part. So be with us in this time of communion. And as a church, may we stand and fight together. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.